All right, welcome to the Friday Transportation Seminar at Portland State University. Um, my name is Chris Monsier. I'm a faculty member in uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, together with my colleagues uh, in Urban Studies and Planning and Civil and Environmental Engineering, we organize and host this uh, Friday Transportation Seminar. It's been a long-running uh, tradition on the campus. So today we're very pleased to kick off the first seminar of the fall uh, quarter uh, with Professor Narelle Howarth. She's the director of Cars Q, um, which, is in, uh, which is in Australia, which you'll find out in a second when you hear her accent. So um, we're very pleased to have her. She's going to talk about a summary of her research, um, which is pretty exciting. I'm looking forward to it. So. Thank you very much. And um, I always thought I didn't have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> so I can understand now, and I do accept that I indeed do have an accent. I don't have a very strong Australian accent, but oh, if anybody wants... Oh, you need to turn your mic on. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So, I hadn't actually said anything of any value yet, so... Um, I think that I don't have a particularly strong Australian accent, but if you want to ask, ask a question about what the Austra strong Australian accent um, is like later, then I can happily do an impersonation if you want. Um, so, I, I'm very pleased to be here in Portland. I've heard a lot about Portland and particularly heard about it in terms of the bicycle facilities that it has. And a lot of my recent research is in the bicycle safety area and so I was coming over for the International Cycling Safety Conference at Davis and I thought, well, Portland's just up the road from, by Australian standards so I'll come here as well. So, I'm very pleased to be here to talk with you today. Um, I'm the director of a an accident research centre, it's a road safety research centre in, in, um, in, in Brisbane, Australia. And so I'll give you perhaps a little bit of a, a background to that. So there's the map, okay? So there's Australia, in, in red is the state of Queensland. Um, Australia has a federal system much like the US and the mixture of responsibilities for different um, things in relation to transport and in terms of um, a road safety in particular, is a little similar to what it is here in the US. So the federal government is only responsible for the vehicle standards and some of the major highways. Everything else in terms of legislation, in terms of licensing, policy and so on, is actually at the state level. So I thought I'd just give you that as, as a perspective because I think that there are, in a sense, more similarities than sometimes that we, we think. Um, Brisbane is the city in, in which our university is, is based. So Brisbane is the capital of Queensland and has a population of, I say a couple of million, I always forget what its population is, but it's a relatively large city. And I suppose that does follow the Australian pattern. That we've got a small number of large cities around the edge of the continent and very little inside and that of course has strong implications for transport systems, for um, road avail network um, affordability and in terms of the number of taxpayers that we have for every kilometre of road is relatively small and that results in, in relatively poor road infrastructure. So that's a little bit of, of, um, of background for you. Brisbane is a subtropical city. Um, today it's going to be 32 degrees Celsius, which I think is 90-something. Um, Celsius to Fahrenheit defeats me. Um, Kilometres to, to miles I can cope with quite well, um, but that's, the, the temperature always does me in. But anyway, it's relatively warm. So it's, it's spring um, in Australia, and in summer in, in Brisbane, most of our days will be between um, 28 and 32 degrees with very high humidity. And that again has implications for active transport as you can imagine. Um, the, so yeah, it's, it's, it is interesting riding to work in Brisbane in the summertime. Certainly a, a great need for showers. So I've, I've just put some photos here to give you an idea. So this is, that's downtown Brisbane. The park area there is the Botanic Gardens. And one of our university campuses borders on those, borders on the botanic gardens there. Okay? Yes, it is showing good. Um, so they're, they're um, Bougainvilliers. And Bougainvilliers obviously give you an idea of what the climate is like. 
And that, there's some of the, um, old, the older and newer buildings on that particular campus. It's the, the one that's close to the city. Our campus isn't close to the city. Our campus is about two miles northwest of the city, and um, it's got some old buildings and some new buildings. And our building's not far from this one. Our building is, of course, right at the top of the hill. It's the hill that's the highest in, in the general area of Brisbane, and we're at the top of the hill. Again, interesting implications for things like riding to work in a city that's, that's really quite hilly. Um, but we have various um, pieces of equipment, including our advanced driving simulator, which is basically a, a general motors vehicle without an engine, with a very um, interesting six degree of, of um, freedom motion platform, which, which sort of gives you the full motion and motion sickness sometimes experience. And there are um, very large screens to give you the 180 degree view of, of what's happening and also um, in the rear mirror, mirror, mirror and the side mirrors it's got the LED display so you can actually, as a perspective of what you would see behind you if you, if you actually were in a real car. We use that for driver behaviour studies but we also do it, use it interestingly for actual simulations of new road infrastructure that hasn't been built yet because it's a lot cheaper to design and, and program new road infrastructure into a simulator and then see how drivers drive it rather than spending many, many millions of dollars of act and actually um, building that in the real road system and then finding perhaps that you've got some problems. So we've looked at various types of um, intersections and interchanges and how they might actually affect people's um, the speed and, and following distance and things like that. And one of our studies, we actually looked at the number of different signs you can put on an overhead gantry and how that, how that actually affects how people drive. Because, I mean, overhead gantries are expensive um, and so the government wants to minimise the number of them, but we don't want to have so many pieces of information for a driver to see that they either make mistakes or don't see things or potentially they slow down so much on the freeway that people run into the back of them or it just generally um, reduces the cap freeway capacity. So there's lots of different things that, that, we, that we do. So our Centre for Accident Research and Road Safety Queensland is 21 years old. It was originally established with funding from the university and the Motor Accident Insurance Commission, which actually is the government body that regulates the, the insurers who pay out if you're hurt in a crash. So really a lot of em emphasis on you know, people being injured there. And they're still our funders. Um, they, together they provide half of our funding. The other half comes from contracts for doing research for government and, con and also research grants, um, which are investigator-driven research. Um, as an accident of history, we're based in the School of Psychology and Counselling in the Faculty of Health. Um, I say it's an accident of history because the, the people who set up the centre were at that stage in the, psycho in the psychology department. Um, most of our staff now are not psychologists, and I'll, and I'll show you some of them in, in a minute. But we're really looking at a vision of a safer world in which injury-related harm is uncommon and unacceptable. And that fits in with, with some of the common um, strategies and, and aims now, such as Vision Zero and, and the safe system. So I think that, that that fits in well with the new directions in, in road safety strategies. Here are some of our people. It's always difficult to get everybody together for a photo. And certainly some of our students are studying by distance, and so they're not there. But there's a mixture of our staff and students. And you can see that there's a lot of them. There's about 40 staff and about 40 PhD and master's students. And um, they're from all over the place, um, from many different countries. So the students there from, from Indonesia, from Bangladesh, from Iran, from Egypt, from Oman, from Australia, from Sweden. I'm just looking at faces as I go along the rows. Colombia, um, Cambodia, um, yeah, so students and staff from all over the place. And the students certainly um, really enjoy um, their, time to, their time together. The, the staff and students are not only from different places, but they're all from, sort of from very different academic backgrounds. 
So some of our um, students and staff have a computer science background, others it's transport engineering, some of them it's public health, some of them it's exercise um, science, and some of them it's statistics, um, yeah, all sorts of um, things. So that's, that's what the centre looks like. We have our activities break down into research, professional training and development, and community engagement and advocacy. So basically, research, education, and advocacy. In research, we have six themes that we look at. Um, and in no particular order, regulation and enforcement is actually looking at research into things like speeding and drink driving and licensing and so on, illegal behaviours generally. And, and particularly in recent years, looking at drug driving. And I'll, I can talk more about drug driving later if anybody's interested, but certainly it's, it's a major issue. School and community injury prevention is looking more at the sorts of things that aren't easily regulated in terms of a, a laws and so on, but things like you know education programs for um, trying to get young people to influence their peers in a positive way um, for reducing injury, and programs for helping parents to supervise um, new drivers, and a whole range of, of other sorts of things, and and also some research looking at driver fatigue. I mean, the size of Australia is roughly the same area as continental US. And you can see that many of those cities are a long way from each other. So driver fatigue is, is a big issue, and particularly in our trucking industry, where the hours of service regulations aren't as strong as they are here in the US, and there's continual pressure on them um, for drivers to drive further and so on. Vulnerable road users is the area that I have until recently headed up. So that's the pedestrians, bicyclists and, and motorcyclists. And I should say in terms of motorcyclists, I, I'm the chair of the um, TRB Motorcycles and Mopeds Committee. So um, that was an area of focus of my research for many years and I still do some in that area. Occupational safety, a lot of that is looking at work-related driving. Work-related driving is the biggest cause of work fatalities in Australia, and it probably is here as well, I, I don't know. Um, but certainly we've got a lot of issues, particularly in some segments like mining. Many of the mines are a very long distance from the population centres. So you'll have miners who are doing, um, commonly doing 12-hour shifts, and then they'll, at the end of their 7 or 14 days of 12-hour shifts, then they'll drive back to where their family are living on the coast. And that drive can be 600 miles. Okay? So you're really looking at this combination of long hours of work and then long hours of driving. And what can we do about those sorts of things? And it's a really interesting clash between industrial and occupational health and safety and road safety practices as to what we can do about that. Road safety infrastructure is largely the, end, the road um, engineering, but also the infrastructure that we need for road safety in terms of data systems and data management and, and so on. In Intelligent transport systems, we're doing a lot in connected and autonomous vehicles and particularly um, we're about to be starting to manage a large trial of retrofit of um, advanced driver assistance systems to 500 vehicles in, in one of the nearby cities. Professional development and training, we train people in road safety audit, we also train people in treatment of crash locations and a whole range of other particular um, types of things. Community engagement and advocacy, we, it's interesting, my perspective is that we do the research which then informs the education and it informs the advocacy. We can't be out there just as crazy advocates because then our research will lose its credibility. So I think that it's a challenge in terms of how do you do the research and disseminate it to try and make improvements in the, in the safety of your community without being seen as actually um, being biased. And I, I think that's a challenge for many professionals and many um, research centres. So we look at training researchers, training practitioners and professional development activities to build the body of safety expertise, and that's something that our government is very keen on us actually working on. 
not all of our research is actually done in Australia. Many of our graduate students are actually doing research which is looking at safety issues in their own country, whether it be one of my students who just finished who was looking at, you know, what, how is disability contributed to by road crashes in Cambodia and what can be done about that in terms of disability systems but also in terms of better um, road safety management. And other students who are looking at, you know, safety on mountainous roads in, in Sabah, in Malaysia and so on. But here are some projects. We've, look, we've worked on the development of the ASEAN Regional Road Safety Strategy. Now ASEAN is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. And there's ten, 10 nations, and they differ dramatically in their level of development and their, even just their topography. So if you can imagine that Singapore is one of those, but Myanmar is also another one. And, the, and Singapore and Myanmar, you, it's very hard to think of two countries that are, that are more disparate in terms of, you know, what are their road safety issues, but what are all of their issues are all together. And so I th it was a real challenge to look at, you know, how do you have a strategy and how do you monitor a strategy given that many of these countries vary dramatically in the level of sophistication of their data systems. So I think that that's just one of the examples. We've looked at a whole range of other things and quite a lot of projects in Oman and, and we've got a whole cohort of students from Oman, Malaysia and, as I say, Cambodia. So I think that it's interesting particularly where we're located in the world, you know, clearly we're a lot closer to Asia than we are to the US. I know that every time I fly. Um, okay. But I thought today, given that the interest of people here in Portland, I might focus a little on our cycling safety research. Though we've done research in a whole range of, of areas of cycling. The parking and bike lanes, I always find I have to explain, because for some I won't say bizarre, but for some reason, in our state, it's legal to park in a bike lane. And so if a car parks in a bike lane, the bike lane is no longer of any use, so you have to go around the car to... And we drive on the left-hand side. I have to explain that too. We drive on the left. So some of my photos and things you might have to adjust for that. So it really is a problem. And the interesting thing, when we did the research, um, we ended up... Um, suggesting to the government that it didn't change the law because our local governments were saying, were saying to us, if they change the law and make it legal to park in bike lanes, well, if we've got a choice between parking and bike lanes, we'll keep the parking and get rid of the bike lane. So, so the approach that's been taken now is looking at, you know, preventing, um, prohibiting parking during peak times. And that seems to be a bit of a compromise. But it, it's certainly there are a whole range of challenges that you face. And sometimes what you think is the immediate answer is not necessarily, you know, what's actually going to be most beneficial in the long term. But I'll talk about a couple of these projects today, and I'm happy to talk about questions about other ones um, later if people have a particular interest. The other thing I should say... Um, as background is that road safety in Australia has very much focused on legislation and enforcement. Um, Alan Williams and I some years ago wrote a paper comparing traffic safety um, cultures in Australia and the US. And um, I think part of it basically comes down to Australians originally being convicts and so having to be kept under control and so on, and that, and that perhaps in a sense that um, that history s still plays out a little. And what it means is that we have a constitution that doesn't provide any rights to individuals. Our constitution, all it does is actually divide up the powers, well, it defines which powers the federal government have compared to the state governments. Because before that, we only had state governments. So it really has nothing to do with individuals. So I think that there's a lot more in terms of law that we do in Australia in terms of regulating people's behaviour than would ever be acceptable here in the US. So hence that's why I suppose a lot of our um, research does look at, at laws and, and the enforcement thereof. Okay, so there's about 40 cyclists who are killed in Australia each year. 
out of a total number of about 1,300 fatalities. Um, the population of Australia is 23 million. So our road fatality rate per head of population is less than, less than the US. But we know that many more cyclists actually suffer high threat to life injuries, and these are ones that really we, sh we need to be doing something about. And we know also from recent, quite a bit of recent research that the trend is going up, and I'll show you some Queensland data in a minute. We sell more bicycles in Australia every year than motor vehicles, but still bicycles are only between 1% and 2% of, ride, of um, trips to work, commute trips. So everyone's got bicycles, almost, but, not so, but a lot of them are rusting in the garage. We have very poor data, and that's, that's spawned a whole lot of research that we've been doing. And also, you know, we have a number of government policies that, that aim to double the amount of cycling, basically, and, and to increase walking for a whole lot of health, mainly, reasons rather than congestion. So there's an emphasis on doing the research. But we have a challenge in the data. Pol police reported data for cyclist injury is particularly poor. On the left hand side that's a police data for the state of Queensland for over a few years and what it's, these are the police data for the crashes which the police say were hospitalisation crashes. And we can see there that vehicle occupants are three quarters of the total number and Motorcyclists are 14% and bicyclists 4%. But if we actually go and look at the hospital data and we look at who was admitted to the hospitals for, for cycling crashes that occurred on the road that theoretically should have been reported to police, we get a very different pattern. So the, mo the, the percentage who are motorcyclists almost doubles and the percentage who are bicyclists increases by a factor of four. So we have this, this issue where a lot of road safety policy and decision making is driven by the police data, but we know that the police data is actually a dis giving a distorted figure of what's happening. And the underreporting isn't just for single bicycle crashes, it's also for bus, for, to a lesser extent, to, for bicycle motor vehicle crashes. And about, we think that about a third of the bicycle motor vehicle crashes where someone ends up in hospital is not in the police data. So it, it is considerable. And what it means when you're making decisions about how much money to spend on bicycle safety and you're basing it on the police data, you make wrong decisions. So this is the hospital data. We can see there's an 8% average annual increase. So a 50% increase in cyclists admitted to hospital over five years. Now it's likely to reflect increases in cycling participation and I'll show you some data in a minute. But if you look at the other part, cyclists are male in Australia. I, I, I sometimes joke that I probably know all of the other female commuter cyclists in Brisbane. It's, not, it's a great exaggeration. But certainly cycling is largely a male activity and it's largely recreational, not commuting in Australia. So we have two groups that in a sense should be a focus for our efforts. There's the, 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 um, the teenage boys and the, 50, the 40 to 60 year old males. Um, it was said for some time in Australia that cycling is the new golf. It's the social activity for professional males. I think Cycling is also the new motorcycling for many of those as well, which may or may not be good. I don't know. From a health point of view, hopefully it is. Um, so given that we've got poor data, one of the things that we actually, I decided to do in 2010, we'd actually go out there and count data in our downtown area. And it's simple counting with a form and, you know, recording what's happening for each cyclist. So we've done that. And we've done it three times now, 2010, 2012, and 2015. And what we've seen is overall, in the five-year period, about a 50% um, yeah, it's about a 50% increase in total in the number of cyclists. So that increase in the hospital admissions looks not too bad in, in some sense. Okay. 
during that period of time, in the 2010 um, data, the, our bike share scheme had just been introduced. We meant to collect data before the bike share scheme, and then they brought forward when it was launched, and so we were collecting the first week of its, its inception. But now it's up to between 4 four and 5 per cent of cyclists observed in the downtown who are on the city cycle bikes. Um, we have mandatory helmet laws. We've had them for more than 25 years um, throughout Australia. And so these people are required to wear helmets. And that, of course, um, we've actually, um, a few years after the bike share, helmet, bike share scheme was introduced, the, the, um, the council made the decision it would have to actually just place helmets in every third ba basket of the, of the bikes. And then the use went up dramatically. Um, so that was interesting. Um, females, still only 17% in the, in the downtown area. And I think one of the challenges, the downtown area has still very poor infrastructure. It has speed limits of 40 kilometres per hour, which is 25 miles per hour on every street except one. But um, it's still not a friendly place to actually ride a bike. And I think that shows in the, in a bit, in the less um, female riding. Um, in Queensland, you're legally allowed to ride on the sidewalk, and I'm sorry I didn't translate footpath to sidewalk for this slide. You're legally allowed to ride on, on the sidewalk. Um, and the trends seem to be a bit of an increase. When we survey riders, they say they're riding on the sidewalk because they're scared of riding on the road, or because the road there is a, is is a one-way road and they actually want to go in the opposite direction. So I think that it's, it's an interesting phenomenon. The helmet wearing rates have been reasonably um, stable and at the, that about 97%. For the city, for the, for the um, bike share bikes, it's a couple of percent lower, but it wasn't statistically significant once we controlled for various other things. Okay. Now this is perhaps giving you an idea. Minimum passing distance is what we call th you call three foot law. Okay. So for us, it's a one-metre law. We had an interesting thing where the law was introduced really quickly, but it was introduced as a two-year trial with the idea that an evaluation had to be conducted to actually continue the rule. Now, there was no collection of before data, okay, because of this. We designed the evaluation framework under won the contract to design the evaluation framework, then we won the contract to actually conduct the um, evaluation. So, um, but then we had to have the evaluation done before the end of the two years in order to give the results to the minister who could then decide whether to continue the law. So given there's an 18-month lag in the crash data, it's an interesting challenge to actually do an evaluation that's and this was the first time that it was introduced in Australia, and every state of Australia was looking and regularly contacting us about what was the, going to be the outcome in Queensland. So, high pressure. We actually, we talked to police, we surveyed um, thousands of cyclists and drivers, we went out there and measured thousands, videoed thousands of cyclists, including about 2,000 actual passing uh, events. And we tried to analyse crash infringement and hospital data, but there wasn't much of that available. So that was the general design, trying to look at the process, the impact and the outcome of actually changing a law. And these are sort of what 0 0.2 metres, 0 0.8 metres, 1.9 metres and 3.2 metres look like. Oh, sorry, there they are. 0 0.2, forgetting about this. 0 0.8, 1.9, and, and the 3.2. So, you know, clearly the 3.2 looks a lot more friendly in many ways. And we looked at these passing events as a function of whether they were in the city or out in the country, and whether how many lanes there were, what the speed limit was, and all those sorts of things. And probably now is where I get a glitch in my presentation, yes. Sorry, I took the video out of that one. But I do have to reassure you that the cyclist was upright after the pass. The cyclist did not get hit. 0 0.2 metres, 20 centimetres is 8 inches. 
Yeah, eight inches. So it's a bit scary. Um, when you, if you see the video, it's even scarier. And the two cars who passed that same cyclist beforehand passed with plenty of room. And you can see there's a l another lane that the car could have gone into. So I, I tell people who know that area not to ride there. Um, no, it's probably just some... Everybody was looking for the results of this, and particularly the media. So, yes, we've got a multi-hundred page report, but we also decided to go in terms of producing an infographic that summarised all of the results in a way that the media could then just insert it into their newspapers, and we knew that way that people were actually finding out what the real results were rather than actually, you know, some journo's misinterpretation of that. So, and I've got copies of this and various other things up the back um, if, you, if you want to take one, and they're also available on our website. So I think that's, that's another issue we've come across le lately is it's not only a matter of doing research in the way that you, the best way that you can, given the constraints that you have, but also of making sure that it's disseminated widely in order to, so that public opinion is then influenced and, and, and government. Um, yeah, and in a way that people can understand. I mean, I was going to say nobody of any importance reads journal articles, but maybe that's too distressed, too disturbing, too um, pessimistic a view of the world. But anyway, but realistically, politicians, decision makers do not read journal articles. They're lucky if they read executive summaries of contract reports. Um, 30 years of experience. Okay. So... As part of the same observations with the cameras, and I should have said that those cameras had infrared filters, it's not that Australia has got a funny looking colour to it. We actually did some, we were paid by the government to do some more sites, which included off-road sites where there's no vehicles and, and school holidays and not school holidays and so on, to look at actually counting how many cyclists were wearing helmets, were not wearing helmets, what sort of clothing they were wearing, what sort of bike, their gender, their age, all those sort of things, to look at you know, how, how good was compliance with our mandatory helmet, bicycle helmet laws. This data was, I think, 27,000 cyclists, um, which lets you do a very nice logistic regressions with lots of different factors because you've got a big sample size. So, overall, more than 98% compliance. Um, a little bit of difference between the people in, uh, you call it spandex, don't you? On racing bikes and the people in what I might call normal clothes. But it's, it's only, um, it's only three, three and a half percent. Um, child riders, girls are good, boys aren't. I've got three boys, I know that. Um, now, my, mine are very good because they wouldn't have survived this long with their mother if they didn't wear a helmet. Um, the highest risk group, though, were the young boys riding after school in their general area. So I think that was interesting. Their, their helmet wearing rate's down to just over 55%. So clearly, that's a group that we've identified that we need, you know, the government needs to focus more on. Got the study pa published in Accident Analysis and Prevention. We had a few, question we had a few questions um, from reviewers about why was our compliance rate so high, um, it's because people wear them. Um, anyway, okay. So areas for future research, just um, finishing up now. We're starting to do some more work looking at electric bicycles, particularly looking at whether we can get a trial going between our two university campuses, which are only a few uh, miles apart, but Brisbane is extremely hilly. And so it's, there's a fair bit of, you know, of elevation difference between the two campuses. So we're interested in, in whether we can get a trial going there. Um, the university's health and safety department has put forward a suggested route which minimises the number of intersections and doubles the length of the, length of the travel. Um, I'll be interested to see if we have the bicycles um, instrumented, whether how many bicycles actually travel on the university's approved route. Um, it's certainly not the route that I choose, and I'm reasonably risk averse. We're also interested in the implications of bicycle paths for the bicycle 
electric bicycles for the design of bicycle paths and other bicycle infrastructure. Our bicycle, off-road bicycle paths are design, have a design speed of about 20, it's supposedly 20 kilometres per hour, which is, you know, what, 12 miles an hour or something like that. Um, and certainly some of the intersections are not real, not intersect. Some of the curves and things and bends are just not up to that even. And given that most of our riders are males who are riding for recreation, uh, uh, not for recreation, they're males who are riding fast anyway, it just doesn't match even the current speed profiles of, of cyclists. So we've been looking at technology for measuring passing distances because clearly if you've got a law, it's helpful if you actually measure what the distance was. Um, that's been a very interesting and unfruitful and problematic. Um, and we're, we're continuing. Um, and I certainly have some contacts with people here in the US who are doing work in that area as well. Improving injury and travel data, and particularly in terms of using apps. Removing some of the barriers that we know for riding to work, given that, given that we have so many people who are riding for recreation who are not commuting. What can we do to try and remove some barriers so we can transform some of those recreational riders into commuting riders, particularly people who are living close to the city? And the safety of older riders. We certainly are seeing a little bit of what's happening in other parts of the world, that older, older riders are con continuing to ride a bit more than they did in the past. They're potentially taking up electric bikes. And, but also we can see from European research that there's a few issues in terms of mounting and dismounting and balance. And, and then, of course, if you do come off where, when you're an older rider, then the potential for fracture and that is, is quite um, greater. So there's some of the things that, that we've been looking at. And I suppose I can't go without advert advertising things, can I? I mean, we've got at least four PhD scholarships open at the moment, so anybody's interested, I've got some flyers up the back. Um, we're certainly always keen to, um, to uh, recruit um, good students from wherever we can get them. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Sorry, I've actually got it written on one of the publications and I can't remember it now. Um, it's probably about $300. 300 Australian dollars, which is probably maybe 250 US or something like that. Is it for like high school kids? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's tricky with the kids. Um, certainly if they were riding with their parents, you know, I'll be, the kids are not going to pay the fine themselves. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't got the data to say how many of the fines are actually issued to kids. It would be interesting to look at. Um, in theory, it applies to them, but in practice, whether the police actually do it or not, I'm, I'm not sure. But yeah, that, that could be certainly an interesting thing to look into. Thanks, August. Uh, you've been working on this for a while. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's been a long time since I've seen you guys. The police data reporting, you know, who was involved in like certain crashes was you know, significantly different than what was reported at the hospital. Has there been efforts on the uh, police behalf to, uh, I guess, kind of you know, maybe short the way that they report their accidents? But. Well, it's actually not the police side of things that's that's the issue in a way. It's actually that the cyclists are not reporting the crash to the police. Oh, I see. It's not that the police are not putting it into their system, and certainly. Um, even anecdotally, I know of many bicycle crashes that, that just never get reported to, to police. I think that um, often, particularly if they're single bicycle, then 
there's no real incentive to do so. And part of that may actually reflect our insurance system, whereby if, you're, if it's a single bicycle crash, um, if you go to hospital, we have universal free health care okay, in Australia. Not being political, but we have. Okay? Which means that if you're hurt and you go to hospital, you'll, you'll get treated in a public hospital. Yeah, so you don't have to. You don't have to do anything about that. And so there's no real incentive to have to sue somebody to get them to pay for your, for your medical care. And also the insurance that our funder actually scheme that they administer is only comes into play if somebody else is at fault. So if it's so it's just not relevant unless your injury is catastrophic. If you've got a catastrophic injury, it'll, it'll cover you regardless of what happened. But if it's not catastrophic, then you know, there's, there's not a lot of incentive on the rider's part to actually report the crash to police. Yeah. Okay. So I was curious, at the end, you talked about future research on measuring the passing distance. And it sounded like maybe for, for research data collection purposes. One person that. And then I see on your center website that you're doing a survey of sort of how well can drivers judge how close they are or Ooh. not. And it makes me wonder, um, sort of thinking ahead to more auto autonomous, connected vehicles, etc. Um, do you know of work being done of you know if you had the vehicle? measuring lives, you know, how far away things are, and then at a minimum giving feedback to the driver, but potentially also changing what the car is doing. Are people working on that? Or? Look, I know that Volvo has made a commitment that it won't be building cars that can, can kill or seriously injure um, vulnerable road users after, by 2020 or something. It's reasonably reasonably soon. Um, so there clearly are a whole number of systems that have been developed by car manufacturers to detect pedestrians and to detect cyclists and to classify them and then of course to apply brake, warn the driver and apply brakes and things like that. But most of the research that I've seen really is looking at people who are ahead of the um, of the car, and I haven't really seen any of that applied in the passing manoeuvre. You know, it's really, in a sense, the rear end that's being addressed by some of that stuff. It's a forward collision warning, in a way, rather than overtaking um, safety. I think that technically it is, it, it would be possible. It's still not, um, it's still not a simple task, given the, you know, predicting the path of the bicycle and things like that. So, um, yeah, we've actually been looking at quite a bit of the technology, and I think that the, it, it's, yeah, it, it's, not, it's not straightforward. I mean, most of the technology we've seen can actually measure the distance within a reasonable degree of accuracy, so it's not the accuracy per se, it's when do you need to take the measurement and how would you then put the whole thing together. Particularly, uh, and I think the enforcement issue, use of such technology is the one that's most, well, where can, we're finding the most pushback against in terms of police want to use, I mean, in Australia we have very, very widespread use of photo enforcement, of speed and red light cameras and so on. And so it's not, and that's well accepted and they're really strict about calibration methods and all sorts of standards and things like that. And they say, we can't assume that a device which a cyclist has fitted to their bicycle will actually be well calibrated and things like that. And so with, we spent far too much of our life in the last year trying to get through this issue and we haven't made the progress yet. But I think that um, in a sense, yes, there's potential for 
vehicle technology to deal with it. But in Australia, at least, the, the, the median age of our cars is more than 10 years. So 50% of our cars are more than 10 years old. In the next 10 years, only, you know, 50% are going to be replaced in it. I mean, the, up, the widespread like, uptake of some of these technologies, this is going to be a long way into our future. And potentially some of the people who need or could benefit most from the technology, particularly younger drivers and older drivers, are going to potentially be the last people to take it up, either for reasons of understanding acceptance or sheer financial reasons. So we have, we have a challenge, and it's not... That's a challenge that I think is way beyond cyclist safety research. I think it's a, a, a challenge that our society is facing at the moment in, in that area. And we have a lot of politicians who will, who will take the easy way of saying, the problem will go away. The problem will go away. We're getting these autonomous vehicles. But the problem's not going to go away quickly. And in the meantime, some of the problems are actually going to get worse. Doesn't sound, doesn't sound pessimistic. No, no, I'm not. Um, it means you've all got a bright future. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned that nationally in Australia, crashes, bicycle crashes are increasing. Hmm. Is your, do you have any way to measure the crash rate? Is the crash rate increasing as well? And if so, what thoughts do you have about what's going on? We have no good way of measuring crash rate. Um, in fact, that was one of the reasons why we did our... We're continuing to do our observational surveys in the city. We have that data. We have counters on many of our major bicycle routes, um, and they're showing increases. But we have a, a national cycling participation survey, which is a, a telephone survey, and that survey is actually showing that the percentage of the population who who ride at particular, you know, monthly or weekly or whatever, has actually been going down. Now, I and many other people find that difficult to believe, given the other data where we've simply counted. So, I mean, it's possible that we've got a smaller proportion of our population riding, but the people who do ride are riding more. That, I mean, statistically, the maths would work out there, okay? but I don't know whether that's what's true. Um, so I think that for cycling safety, as well as whole motorcycling as well, and, and also pedestrian safety, this idea of knowing how much of the activity is happening so we can calculate the risk is really a big challenge and not the sort of thing that governments are excited about funding, frankly. Um, the, the CBD study we've been doing repeatedly now um, is we self-fund because I'm saying if we're going to if any big policy change happens I want to have the before data because nobody else is going to have it um, so I'm willing to fund the data collection myself um, oh out of spare bits of money you know? little little hollow logs where we've got some funds hidden away here and there <laughs> yeah Alice Bruce, um, could you describe uh, more of what the the city's bike infrastructure is like? Because you were talking about how a lot of the bicyclists do it for recreational use, but are they using the, the infrastructure that goes through downtown that they could possibly also use for commuting? But there's not using No. Uh, no uh, yes. yes, I can answer your question. I sort of started with a no, then should I? The, the very little of the recreational riding occurs of the, in that downtown network that we were counting the riders on. Okay. Um, we, have, we have a river in Brisbane, and the, called the Brisbane River, not surprising. And it's sort of a bit like a snake. It snakes its way through the city. We, we joke that it actually was designed by real estate agents to try and maximise the amount of river frontage in the city. It really is very inconvenient, and I, uh, important, I think you can understand some of these things. Um, so recently, most of our new bridges that have been built have been non-car bridges. So we have quite a, we have uh, one, two, 
three completely non-car bridges, and um, and that's changed people's commuting patterns as well as cyclists' commuting patterns quite a bit too. Um, we have, with the exception of one rail bridge and one freeway bridge, all of the other bridges have got cycling infrastructure to cross the river. We have, for a fair bit of the river, we've got paths along each side. And so a very common um, recreational ride is called the Brisbane River Loop. It goes, it goes two doors away from my house. Um, and it's partly off-road, partly on-road, and it's about 25 miles the loop, to do the loop. And, yeah, people will do multiple loops and do loops before work in the morning and so on. Um, so, and the government has had the policy for the last... Well, it, it fell out when government changed, but it came back again. Of any new urban freeway, there's a dedicated, separated, high-speed cycle facility running directly next to it. So um, then you can, you can ride into work at the peak hour and pass lots of cars and hopefully they see you passing them. Um, so that there's, despite it being hot and hilly, the infrastructure is not too bad. But I think some of the, some of the quite popular routes are a little bit, um, the faster riders may be putting off people who are not faster riders. So we have cyclist-cyclist tension, um, which I don't know whether it's a big issue in other places or not, but we, we do have that. Is that sort of answering your question? Yeah, there's quite a lot of money being spent on, on the infrastructure. Um, with regards to the minimum passing distance, um, this is only based on the driver estimation, or there is a law for that, like you should keep like 1.5 meters from the as a minimum passing distance. Well, the the law says that if you're driving in a in a on a road with a speed limit of 60 kilometers an hour, which is about 38, I think, a miles per hour or lower, then the 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 driver must not pass closer than one meter from the cyclist. The distance is measured in the law, is defined in the law from the right, because we drive in the, we're on the left, remember, from the rightmost protuberance of the bicycle, which is either the edge of the handlebars or the, or the cyclist, depending on the shape of the cyclist and the shape of the bicycle, um, to the leftmost edge of the vehicle, which is generally the edge of the side mirror. Okay? Now, technologically, while that makes sense from a safety point of view, technologically it's actually relatively difficult to measure. Um, so that's one metre in those lower speed zones and 1.5 metres. So if you, in theory, you can get a ticket if you are, are less than that distance. I think one of the challenges and one of the reasons we're doing the research that was mentioned before is that when we did the surveys, lots of drivers said that they were uncertain about whether they were leaving that much distance or not. They wanted to be doing it, but they were uncertain whether they were doing it. So our, one of my students at the moment has the survey out where she's actually taken lots and lots of photos from the, from the driver's perspective of cyclists who are at particular measured distances from the side of the, the vehicle. And she's also got done it with small, medium, and large vehicles to see whether vehicle size actually will contribute to how hard it is to make that judgment. And she's also looking at drivers who also cycle and drivers who don't also cycle. So we're certainly, and, and also drivers' attitudes to cyclists with the idea that maybe that might contribute as well. So hopefully, if she gets some good data in time, um, we'll, we'll be able to try and drill a bit into, you know, how well are drivers actually able to make these judgments? How accurate can they be? Yeah. So I think, I think we're closing in on the end of the seminar. So before we thank Professor Haworth for her uh, great talk today, I want to announce that next week it will be uh, Travis Glick uh, will be giving his uh, 
master's thesis presentation uh, on use of archived bus transit data. A reminder that next week after the seminar is the faculty student mixer in transportation right after here, one o'clock, free food. Um, and, and with that, um, thanks Professor Howard for your talk today.